I'm a bestseller. Best yeah, reach for my goals, hit it dead center. What? Hit it dead center. Gentlemen, welcome to Barbarians. We have some of our signature dishes here for you. Our classic Caesar salad with thick cut grilled bacon, uh, some classic steakhouse sides, sauteed mushrooms, our crispy spicy Brussels sprouts, um, russet potato fries, and we have a cauliflower steak with chimichurri sauce for Monsieur Laroque. So the whole menu. Chef, thank you. You've outdone yourself. Oh, my absolute you. pleasure. Great to have you guys here. Thank you. Well, we have to eat the way these guys eat when they're on the road <laughs> because I, I feel like this is the hockey culture where on the road with the team, you go out, have a meal, break bread, get together with the fellas. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's nice when you have 20 built-in friends, you get to go to all these cool new cities and, uh, you know, experience obviously different restaurants. So this is, uh, this is pretty on par for what we do. When you guys are on the road, like, do you, is credit card roulette still a thing or, or just everybody just like, ah, just, you know, separate checks? Credit card roulette's still in play. Um, that's pressure. I think play. it's, I mean, that's one of the best, best moments of the, of the meal, <laughs> you know, is, is, is that seeing everyone sweat. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, you split it down the middle. Usually, that's kind of usually the norm, I would say, is as long as no one's going off the board and ordering like the $160 Wagyu steak. Right. You can split it down the middle. Do you learn more about your guys in terms of what motivates them, their backstories, their history, that some of the differences and some of the similarities in those spaces? Well, you, it's always on the road that they always say that um, that's when the team always get closer, get together, because at home you have games or you have family and everything, right? On the road, you're on the bus together and they're playing together. So, yes, you do spend way more time together and mm -hmm. when you right. talk. And that's when you get to know your teammates even more when you're there. Have you noticed a difference throughout your career in terms of the stuff guys are willing to talk about? I think so. You know, I've, this is my 14th year, so I think, you know, you look at the world in general, there's much bigger focus on mental health. And I think because of that, you know, people are, are more open, players are more open. You've seen a lot of teams bring in, you know, sports psychologists and, and uh, make that a, a focus in the locker room, you know, and, and uh, I think it's been great. And uh, I think you go much further as a team when you're all well connected and when you can share, you know, share those moments with each other and, and know, you know, how to help your teammate out when it's, when it's time. You two were members of the NHL Player Inclusion Coalition, so you had these types of conversations actually in the locker room with players from across the league. What was that like? It's one thing to say that the hockey is for everyone, but if you want to say that the league, uh, you want to be diverse, you want to make sure that there's no incident that happens, right? So to talk about many different subjects with, with players and, and to exchange, talk to them and ask them questions, beyond closed door, no media, no one's there, just us and them, I thought it was awesome, and it was well-received and a really positive experience. What kind of stuff are you guys talking about? We talk about the importance of diversity. So European players make the league global today. So if you want to make the league even more global and even more popular in the States, when we talk about diversity, it's important also with, with different minorities, especially black minorities, where there's less and less that are playing. So we talk about that, ways to open up the games, ways to make the game more accessible. And we talk about some incident also that happens to make sure that if anyone was to witness anything, they could become an ally because you guys know, uh, you should, and Kevin, you would know that in the hockey world, we're uh, thought to, to not to say anything, not to be a distraction. So maybe if you hear something, you, you hear a racist comment to one of your teammates or someone else, you're not going to say anything because it's just easier. You just want to close your eyes. In this gesture we talk, we're teaching them not to do so, to be an ally, to, 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 to denounce it if it was to happen. Because then the guy that you're playing with, when you see that you have his back, you feel a sense of belonging. For sure, I, I, the hockey has maybe tamed personalities, you know, and, and uh, no self is bigger than the team. But in these instances like, that George is talking about, I mean, it's a separate ball game. That's the root of the culture of hockey is um, no matter what you have, a band of brothers and they're gonna stick by you and we need to make sure that 
we're staying as inclusive as possible and making sure that we're opening those doors and, and allowing, you know, young kids from, um, you know, the BIPOC community, whatever it might be, to know that they have a place and know that they're going to be supported when they come into, you know, the hockey environment and into that culture. So these conversations, a lot of times are not comfortable. How would you approach someone who maybe is like, ah, eh, this doesn't really have to do with me? I think my, my approach has always been, you know, if, you know, a certain situation, like, do you think that was right? Or, um, you know, is it, is it something that you feel you need to speak out on? You know, and, and that doesn't sit well with you. And if you, you know, if, if something that happens, you know, in the world, you should be able to have a voice and you should be able to speak out about that regardless of whether you feel it's right or wrong. You need to know that you have a voice and it can be talked about in the locker room. And again, I think that's why you, you build these relationships with your teammates because you should have the opportunity to say what you feel and have that space to, to be able to project your voice. I've been to rooms where guys would say, why do I have to get involved? Right. And I love that they were honest enough to, somebody's honest enough to ask me this while I'm doing this at the end is because they're fully confident that they could ask any question and it's okay with it. Not everybody's built to, to be a, the voice and to stand up for anything that happens. And if an SNS was to happen, all together, collectively, we have to take a stance for our teammates if something was to happen to our teammates. And, and it's so important to understand, to understand the situation um, and the respect. If let's say there's no minorities in your team, you never know if tomorrow you could trade it to a team that has some. You never know if somebody is gonna come in. You never know at any point of your career. You never know if you're ever gonna witness an incident. And if people still don't wanna say anything, they don't have to. But at least the thing that we would expect from everyone is their respect. Make sure that you're never gonna say anything stupid you're not gonna do anything stupid because now you, you had that education and now you know what's right and what's wrong. How do you do the calculus on when you will comment publicly about something, whether it's a, a tragedy or it's an injustice or what have you? There's some subject that if you wanna comment on social media, make sure you educate it. Because sometimes it's uneducated comments you'll do that could get you in trouble. So that's why sometimes I can understand here at a moment, if you don't know the whole story and you say something, you just have to be careful. And that's, that comes with being a professional player, right? So, uh, and there's some, so many things that happen in society, like not just racism, but regarding many things. And sometimes you do see players, you know, putting comments and delete them after and stuff like this, which I understand, but that's why what we do with our group, the NHL Player Coalition group is educate players. So if they were to take a stand regarding anything attacking diversity or anything like this, they will know how to respond if they want to. But we do talk about how social media is a tool but a dangerous tool also if you're not careful about it. Because course, yeah. sometimes uh, you can get in trouble if you're not careful about the stuff that you say in there because the world is watching you. So I'll to be a little vocal on things when it comes to you know human rights issues, the, the way I see it. But I'll often get back, well, you don't understand. You didn't play, you're not from the hockey community. But whether it's issues of race or gender, or you know, the LGBTQ plus issues, often I'll hear, well, nothing to see here. We don't have a problem. You bringing up is the problem. You guys are within the sport. Like, is there an acknowledgement that there should be some steps taken? Or do you hear and see the same? Every aspect um, of equality is important, you know? And uh, we're taking a step equality and movement in all these different departments because when we say hockey is for everyone, it starts with the education and, and it's important to talk about it and, and to join different cause and, 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 and it's not just our group, it's not just the dress room talk, but it's getting involved in the community also for these different causes. So it's, 
it, it's be an example that educating and to make sure that we show everyone that they have their young kids that want to put them into hockey. They know that it's a safe sport and it's for everyone, whatever gender you are, your sexual orientation, you're welcome to play this beautiful game of hockey. I think as a player, <clears throat> you know, you go to all these different cities, you skate around in warm-ups and there's all different, you know, adults, kids, they're standing on the glass and all they want to do is just make eye contact with you, wave, and, you know, they could, like we just talked about, there it's it's diverse. They could be uh, from the LGBTQ plus community. They could be from, you know, the minority community. And that moment for them is so huge. And I think that's where our responsibility is as as players is to to get out and be an ally and and be able to open the door to to hockey for for young kids, even if they don't ever touch the ice and, and skate and, and play, like if they know that the hockey community is one where they can go find a job, if they know that this is a community where we welcome that, I think that's, you know, for me, the ultimate goal. How often in your career were you the only black dude in the room? It's, it's crazy because most of my career, other than Edmonton, in Edmonton, one time were five of us. Yeah, that was the oh, year. Oh, we know. Yeah. And it'll never happen again. Ensign Carter, Mike Greer, Joaquin Gage, Sean Brown. Uh, when I played in Phoenix, I was alone in Pittsburgh. I was alone in Montreal, too. But uh, that time in Edmonton, it kind of looked like at that year that it was going to start growing, that minority was going to get more interested in hockey. But the numbers kind of went down a bit and hasn't been really high so and uh, that's why um, lately when we looked at stuff it was important to to, to show everyone that uh, even though that there's not a lot of representation it's a safe sport for any minorities any any black kids that want to play hockey and uh, that's why we try to bring hockey to different communities to the parents to show them that you know it's a good sport it's a safe sport for you but we, there's so many programs that we're creating and, and guys in our group uh, have initiative to, to help to grow the games, to make sure that more minorities get interested. Because at the end of the day, like Kevin said earlier, we just want the NHL to grow uh, throughout uh, the world, throughout the states. And the more I think kids will get to learn and see this beautiful sport, the more we're going to want to play and get involved. It, was it different? going to the arena every day when you were in Edmonton and you had those guys with you? Did it feel different for you? Uh, to be honest with you, no. Because um, once you make it to the NHL, right, it's like when you look at the team, it's, it's a family and you go in a war together, right? Uh, we realize more the impact of it when the media started talking about how historical that it was. But we've never once sat down and be like, oh my God, there's five of us out there. We all knew that we had to face extra hurdles to be there, but why talking about it? Why bringing it up? We were there now. So we never really mentioned it much. The others didn't decide in 2000 to be, okay, let's make a lineup like that. Teams, the NHL want to win. They try to do the best lineup they can to win, right? Not to please or to be part of history, right? You try to do the best lineup you can to win the Stanley Cup. I hope uh, we're not doing credit card roulette. This. <laughs> <laughs> we're making the rookie today. <laughs> I don't know. Is this one of the situations yeah. where the star plays? <laughs> this is rookie party. So we're splitting down the middle. Would you like to trade us today? <laughs> this is great. Oh, this is awesome.